It may become clear by the end of this talk that who we, Americans, thought we were, who we were told we were as soldiers and as Americans, might not actually cohere with who we actually have been as a nation, who we have been and who we really are. And then, of course, I'd love to kill your questions. If I do this right, I'll be done in 50 minutes, and we'll have a good 20 to 30 minutes to talk. I must begin, I'm afraid, with the following disclaimer, which is on my slide. I'm still on active duty in the U.S. military. I have been under investigation at least once, very seriously. Uh, the views expressed in this talk are those of the author, me, expressed in an unofficial capacity, and they do not reflect the official policy of the Department of the Army, the Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. In fact, I can tell you they're actually the opposite, usually. <laughs> So how did I get here? I asked myself that question more than I'm comfortable admitting. How did a West Point grad and a two-war veteran who served in the U.S. Army since before his 18th birthday come to such a place of stark dissent, which is where I live today? I hope, in a sense, that I can explain it along, I suppose, with an explication of my own evolving view of U.S. policy in the Middle East. In that sense, I hope to persuade you, though I must admit that in today's tribally divided political space, persuasion is a difficult, if not impossible, task. My father, Bob, who I wish could be here, is a hawkish and reflexively pro-Trump and pro-Israel political conservative. I've been unsuccessful at persuading him, so what hope can I have with the group of strangers? <laughs> but let's get on with it. Uh, I'll begin with talking about myself and how I got here, and then I'll work in my way into Israel. So for a while there, I was a real star. I was high up in my class at West Point. I had tough to combat deployments in both tours, medals for valor. I had a slew of glowing evaluations, and I even had a teaching assignment back at the military academy at West Point. I inhabited a universe that most only dream of. I was praised, padded, and highly respected by everyone in my life system and viewed as a brave American soldier. It was a safe and it was a sensible spot, and for most that's enough. Too bad it was all bunk. It was absurdity incarnate. The truth is I fought for next to nothing for a country that, in recent conflicts, has made the world a deadlier and a more chaotic place. Even back in 2011 in Afghanistan, quite frankly, in 2006, in Iraq for that matter, I was just smart and just sensitive enough to know that and to feel it viscerally. Still, the decision to do what I've done recently, to publicly dissent, is a tough one. It's by no means easy. Easy would be to go on playing hero and accepting the adulation while staying between the lines. You play it safe, you stick to your own, you make everyone proud. That's easily, it's intellectually mature, immature, but it's easy, and it's the new American way. When you take the journey of dissent that I have taken, you lose friends, you alienate family, you confuse confidants, and you become a lonely voice in your professional world. I have spent years sitting in military classrooms from West Point to Fort Knox, Kentucky, to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, as the odd man out, the outlier, the confusing character in the corner. It's like leaving the church and becoming an atheist, all the while still living in the monastery. <laughs> Still, the truth is that the military is more accommodating than one might suspect. I wrote a critical book, a memoir, published some skeptical articles, but it's not as though anyone in the military outright threatened me. The pressure is different. It's more subtle. It's veiled warnings from your superiors and cautious advice from your mentors. Don't do this, Danny. You won't get promoted. Don't do this, Danny. You might lose your pension. I waited too long to dissent, by the way, and I have to live with that. I admit as much. Maybe I needed a decade to stew on this, or perhaps my brief sojourn in civilian graduate school took, shook something loose. Nonetheless, a few, weir, a few years back, the emotional weight was unbearable and out poured the dissenting waves, and that brings me here tonight. Looking back, I can just about see my own path, what I saw and how I felt. And I can trace the guideposts and the waypoints on a road to spiritual and intellectual rebirth. The images flicker, mental fragments that explain my wayward track to dissension. Slide, please. Uh, slide, please. In Baghdad, I saw chaos unleashed 
I watched the sectarian civil war unfold. I witnessed the strife of our ill-advised, unprepared invasion unleashed. We were terrified voyeurs to the tragedy playing out before us. Militias left gruesome bodies in the streets for us to find each morning. The Sunnis would cut off heads and leave them for us. The, the, the Shiites preferred power drills to the temples and the joints. Both sides attacked us. Sunni and Shia. Through it all, the locals would treat us to stories about how it was actually better under the secular brutality of Saddam Hussein. That was hard to swallow for a young American officer told by his president that Saddam Hussein was the devil. Well, then there were the patrols, so many patrols. They were mostly useless, of course. Show presence, provide security, don't get blown up. Then your kids start getting hit. It comes in flashes, scrubbing your sergeant's blood out of the Humvee so you can patrol the next morning, doing it yourself as a lieutenant because you dare not ask one of your soldiers to do it. Cleaning up another soldier's skull, fatally penetrated by a copper slug, his face frozen in a look of terror, trashed from the filthy East Baghdad street beside his face. The aftermath of car bombs in the marketplace, the haze of the smoke and the stench of the burning flesh, ordinary Iraqis were the usual victims. Then you leave the war zone, you're back home, alcohol. Your driver kills himself, my driver killed himself. Found hanging from a belt in his closet. Time passes, another mate is dead, he overdoses on prescription pills. Dead kids, my boys, and the wives and mothers that I did not have the courage to face for years. Nothing improved, not really. The end state in Iraq was the Islamic State, ISIS, fracture, more death, Trump, a new American crusade on the Euphrates. Next was Afghanistan, my second war. An unwinnable war. The 13th century irrigation system, realizing that the locals don't want to live in our image, they don't yearn to be Americans. In fact, um, mo most American policymakers believe that inside of every Arab, inside of every Muslim, if you just unzip them, is an American waiting to get out. It's not true. I knew eventually that most villagers, at least in southern Afghanistan where I worked, they generally agreed with the basic contours of the Taliban agenda. Allied sheiks and friendly Afghan government officials, they grew the poppy, the heroin, that our patrols slogged through. Obtuse American colonels who wanted to be generals would wall off or barbed wire Afghan villages as if we were in Baghdad, South Africa, or worse. I discerned eventually, as I sat on the sandbags of my small outpost, the Alamo of Kandahar province, as I like to call it, we were attacked every day, that we only held the ground we stood on and nothing else. I would turn down invitations from our Afghan allies, quote unquote, to attend their regular hash-smoking buggery parties, and I am not joking. I would have to explain to my US-trained Afghan officers outsiders from the north who didn't even speak the local language of the southern district I was in, that they have to stop torturing their own deserters, appearances and all. Watching young men lose limbs and lose lives to pad the resumes of aggressive majors who wanted to be colonels and colonels who wanted to be generals. Some of them could hardly spell Afghanistan. Still, they mostly succeeded in promotion and maybe they'll run the next war. 17 years, and there's thousands of Americans still there in both Iraq and Afghanistan, and the Taliban control more of the country than at any time since Uncle Sam's invasions, and we may never leave. I promise you we will reach the 20th anniversary of that war. We're at 17 now. And then one day in Afghanistan in 2011, I realized that everything I was doing, the only thing I still cared about was damage control, protecting my own troops from needless death. I was basically phoning it in. And I should have known it was time to quit, lest I lose more of my soul. But even so, the easy path to promotion and awards beckoned. Of course, I tried to convince myself, as so many do, that staying in the military is itself courageous, that it's possible to change the system from the inside. I was told that by my mentors. And that good people, critical thinkers like me, purportedly, need to stay the course rather than jump ship. Maybe it's true, maybe it's fantasy, who really knows? 
But this business, my business, it damages you. It takes something from you. It's a permanent loss. It affects everyone different, differently, and probably I am a distant outlier. There are not many military officers like me. I think I know most of them who public dissent, and I can count them on two hands. Anyway, nowadays my heart is with the Rohingya in Myanmar, the Palestinians in Gaza, who I'm going to talk about tonight. Oftentimes, places I've never been, people I've never met. I'm going to Palestine for my first trip this January. It's a sad world once you are that inside yourself as I am. And still life trudges along. My ex-wife shops for paint colors for our new house. She engages with the kids and she lives in the moment. I struggle with such practicalities because in so many ways I'm not here. Not most of me anyway. I'm in Baghdad staring in wonder at the aftermath of a truck bomb. I'm in Afghanistan delivering a memorial address for one of my dead troopers, a kid, to be honest, that I hardly knew. Next slide, please. Likely I'll die a sad man, this much I know. But for now, I can give voice to a different path, a nobler cause, a chance, at least a chance, of common sense, sober strategy, and just maybe a semblance of peace, something a whole generation of my peers has never known in my own minuscule way. I will try. Now we, the few of us who care to question, we owe at least that much, and I choose to do with my pen and with my voice. That's all I have. And that requires the courage to describe the root of the problem. And the root of the problem, and this is where we get into the topic of today's talk, the root of the problem is America's one-sided relationship with Israel and its consequent effect on innocent Palestinians and the opinion of Arabs and Muslims worldwide. What I just told you is dangerous to talk about. What I just told you will cost me jobs in DC or New York. By taking a stand on Israel and Palestine, I'm putting myself in a dangerous position. I realize that even to say what I just said is dangerous. For a writer, any criticism of Israeli military action is a veritable third rail in American politics. Touch that nerve and you're open to charges of anti-Semitism or worse. Still, the recent events in Gaza demand that some of us, at least, shed light on the plight of the Palestinians, and I hope to do that tonight. Let us begin with a thought experiment. Imagine dozens of unarmed, protesting, Caucasian Christians or Jews, say Israelis or Europeans or Americans, were shot dead by heavily armed brown folks, like, say, Palestinian Muslims. What would we call this? Well, that's easy. We would call it terrorism. How would the media cover such an event? That's simple, too. Extensively and emotionally, probably for days on end. The smiling faces of the Caucasian victims would be splashed across the screens of television networks from Fox News to MSNBC. Heck, for proof, just look at the recent past. Look at the terror attacks in France and Belgium, for instance. Certainly, even decades back, Americans demonstrated more empathy for white Christian victims. I was raised Irish Catholic. When, in 1972, British paratroopers fired into a crowd of demonstrators in Northern Ireland, killing 13, the episode was christened Bloody Sunday. I come from a city, New York, that's where I was raised, where sympathy for the Catholic Irish was so robust that certain bars that I used to go to, before I was 21, <laughs> used to overtly collect money in tip jars for the terrorists in the IRA well into the 1990s. Well, something remarkably similar has occurred over the past year as thousands of Palestinians protesting the deplorable conditions of the 1.8 million human beings besieged in Gaza were subjected to Israeli army gunfire that has left hundreds dead and thousands wounded. Now to date, only a handful of Israelis have been killed. This is typical of the recurrent violent episodes in Gaza and the West Bank. Scores or hundreds of Palestinians die, often including many women and children, whilst few, if any, Israelis are killed and wounded. Still, the mainstream U.S. media covers each incident as though there is a parity of blame, responsibility, and suffering. It's a very old and it's a very persistent farce. Next slide, please. 
Language is a weapon in the semantic combat of the war for Palestine. In the American media, Israeli gunfire is, quote, a response to Palestinian, quote, actions. It's never a massacre. It's never a war crime. The very soil on which these events occur are dubbed territories, not a Palestinian homeland promised by successive UN resolutions, not as a space illegally occupied by Israel's military as part of what is, in truth, a far right-wing settler colonial project. Next slide. Silence is also a weapon, and it's wielded skillfully by America's corporate media personalities, or celebrities, or media is entertainment more than it is news. <coughs> Running the gamut from Sean Hannity on Fox News to Rachel Maddow on MSNBC. I like Rachel, but she's wrong on Palestine. No doubt the Gaza story that isn't will always be drowned out by domestic stories. Porn stars that Donald Trump pays off. Sexual assault, Donald Trump's character, if we can call it that. Take your pick. But see, it's not just that. One night a few months back, I sat on my couch reading a marvelous, compassionate, and fair article on the Gaza crisis from a former CIA veteran named Paul Pilar. He writes for the National Interest, mostly. I write there as well. He quoted, I, qu he, I quoted a passage from his powerful text in an article I was drafting then as a demonstration of American apathy. I clicked on the television. CNN and, and MSNBC were both focused on Stormy Daniels, Russiagate, and the raids on Donald Trump's lawyer's property. Fox, appropriately, had Alan Dershowitz, the wildly pro-Israeli hawk, on as a guest. And even he wasn't talking about Gaza, because Gaza is the story we dare not speak of. Americans, by and large, don't care about the Palestinians. People in this room do, but our neighbors on the outside don't. We all know that, or we wouldn't be here today. Well, they're busy scrounging a living struggling to get by in an era of wage stagnation. For all the talk about how good the Trump economy is, wages have been stagnant since 1964 for working people. Those people have only so much empathy to go around. Besides, even if they wanted to know about the violence, even if they might be sympathetic to the plight of the Gazans, our corporate media ensures their ignorance. The ongoing massacre in Gaza is when critically analyzing our media space, the dog that doesn't bark. Next slide, please. We have neither the time nor the collective energy to recount the scope of the problem, the full history of Israel-Palestine. I don't have time to do that tonight. Most of you already know it. But for those interested, I suggest that you start with Israeli historian Ilan Pape's The Biggest Prison on Earth, A History of the Occupied Territories, a, a lovely book. Very depressing, but... Accurate. For our purpose, let us instead examine just one stated grievance of the Gaza protesters. They seek recognition of their right to return. We've all heard that phrase, the right to return. To where, you ask? To the homes and lands that their parents and grandparents fled or were forced from in the face of Israeli army offensives in 1948 to 49 or 1967. Some families even keep the actual keys to their old homes, heirlooms of an injustice imposed. And here's where matters get complicated. Let's be honest. The Palestinians are never likely to actually return to those homes. Many no longer exist. Most are occupied by Israeli families for whom the story of 48 is a distant memory of a crime they, to be fair, didn't themselves commit. It's unrealistic, even if that's deeply unfair, and it is, to assume that hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, most of whom are rather young, will someday dislodge all those Israeli citizens and recreate a village life that no longer exists. We have to get real. The protests in Gaza, though, are authentic, and they're honorable, and they're explicable. And yes, I'm even including the angry youths tossing stones and rolling burning tires. I may not approve of the methods, but as Martin Luther King Jr. once said of America's race riots, quote, I think we have to see that a riot is the language of the unheard. So it was in Detroit, so it is in Gaza. Next slide, please. The people of Gaza, 1.8 million of them, are blockaded. This is the damage after the last bombing. 
are blockaded in one of the most densely populated strips of land on this planet. They are, they are denied the civil rights of Israelis or the citizens of their own national state. They are people in limbo. They live in a sort of socio-political limbo with spotty electricity, poor sanitation, soaring unemployment, and gripping poverty. Gaza has regularly been referred to, at least among the few analysts who care to study this forgotten spot on Earth, as one large, quote, open-air prison. For what crime, you might ask, are these Palestinians being incarcerated? For being Muslim, of course. For not being Jewish. For simply not fading away they were expected to. They cannot, we are told, receive any relief so long as they support, quote, terrorists. I'm going to, I'm off script, I'm going to uh, Palestine, to the West Bank, and hopefully Gaza, although I don't know, in January, my family, Trump supporters, who uh, think I'm a traitor, both to my country and my army, they said, uh, oh my God, Danny, you can't go to Palestine. They're all terrorists, they'll cut your head off. It tells you how Americans have framed the Palestinian people. Because to an American, a white nationalist who walks into a school and kills 25 kids, is that's not terrorism. But if that person is vaguely brown, vaguely Arab, or vaguely Muslim, they are immediately terrorists. So for what crime are these Palestinians being incarcerated? For being Muslim, for not being Jewish, for not fading away. They cannot, we are told, receive any relief so long as they support terrorists. By this, the Israelis mean that Palestinians are to be punished for voting the wrong way. We believe in democracy unless the Palestinians don't vote the way we like. So by choosing Hamas in what international monitors admitted was a free and fair election, they were branded as terrorists. Democracy is a tricky thing, after all. You can't control it once you start it. Hamas, to be fair, has moderated from its earliest extreme Islamist manifestations. It has offered truces with the Israeli government. We don't hear this on the news very often. And Hamas, ironically, gains support the more that Palestinians are kept under an Israeli thumb. The more that Israelis push the Palestinians into the ground, the more likely they are to support the more Islamist and extremist factions within their societies. This, like so much American policy in the Middle East, is counterproductive to the point of absurdity. So what can be done? How can tensions be cooled and some sort of fairness ensured? It's hard to know, actually. There are no easy actors and malign, there are no easy answers and malign actors exist on both sides, to be fair. Some Palestinians are terrorists. Most, however, are not. The vast majority are not. Still, I'd suggest the Israeli state and the international community must at least recognize the earlier injustice inflicted on the Gazan refugees, perhaps accept their symbolic right of return and offer tangible reparations, as well as a genuine path to independent statehood along with the West Bank. It's not, un it's not unheard of, by the way. Reparations is a dirty word in America. Oh my God, it's almost as dirty as affirmative action. You can't, you can't say that word. Ooh. It's a naughty word in America. Reparations is a dirty word in the U.S. discourse, conjuring as it does images of supposedly unworthy, whining African-American complainers. This is the way it's framed in the United States. Leaving that problematic framing aside, other countries, other countries besides the U.S., have successfully granted reparations for marginalized communities. Australia has officially apologized and paid monetary reparations to what remains of their displaced and nearly destroyed aboriginal population. Most of you don't know that. Canada, just to our north, not too far from here, too, <laughs> has apologized to its aboriginal people, which it refers to as First Nations, and has paid lump sums to thousands of natives in reparations. Israel, like the United States, is a proud, rich nation and loath to admit error and pay out damages. Still, there is strength and prudence in contrition. 
but I wouldn't expect it from Israel anytime soon, so long as they're led by the right-wing government they have today. Now, before the accusations of this author's anti-Semitism and naivety commence, if this ends up on YouTube, I expect more death threats. Wouldn't be my first. Listen closely to what I am saying. And not everyone in this room will necessarily agree with this. This 70-year conflict is complex and ever-changing. There is plenty of blame to go around. Israel has a right to exist as a state, and its citizens ought to expect a reasonable degree of security. But what Israel may not demand is some fantasy of absolute security from any and all threats, which no country, not even the U.S., can achieve. The continued right to flout international law, as the Israelis do, and to maintain hegemony from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River is not acceptable. No other country gets to do that. And that is because the inverse of my assertion of basic Israeli rights is equally true. And listen to what I'm saying. Palestinians have a right to a state to demand full civil and political entitlements and a reasonable degree of security. We're always asked whether or not Israel has a right to exist. I say yes, Israel does have a right to exist, but so do the Palestinians. They deserve not to be forgotten, and in the American media they're forgotten. One morning months ago I couldn't sleep. I'd been watching the BBC, that's the only news I watch, I, I can't watch the American channels anymore. They don't even cover foreign policy, the BBC does, so does Al Jazeera America. I've been watching the BBC cover the Gaza massacres and I was haunted from a line from one of my favorite poems by Dylan Thomas, who was a Welsh poet from around the era of World War II, and it's on my wrist um, for the three soldiers of mine that died in Iraq, my, my top bracelet here. He said, after the first death, there is no other. After the first death, there is no other. He was talking about the bombing of London, by the way, in World War II. He saw a little girl body in the street and what he's, his point was after you've seen one death there is no other it's after that it's all equal and you have to speak on behalf of the downtrodden so I rose from my bed and I began typing a stream of consciousness Jack Kerouac style plea for the sanity from my own perspective as a dissenting military veteran that's how I started my talk and a friend of the Palestinians which I think I am and I'd like to read you an excerpt from that tonight this is what I wrote that morning at 5.55 a.m. I'm ashamed. It's 5.55 a.m. and I wake up once more for one of my last few days in the Army, the end of a middling soldier's career here at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. The BBC, I refuse to watch mainstream American news in 2018, is ablaze with the latest reports from the Gaza Strip, more than 60 unarmed Palestinians were massacred in one day along the border. Many of you remember that day. Ever so typically, not a single Israeli soldier or citizen was killed. And then Israel sends its apologists, ministers, to speak to the world, to America really. That's who they're speaking to. They deserved it, quote unquote. They were all terrorists, quote unquote. Quote, Hamas was behind the protests. Israel must protect its border. And on and on the sardonic ablutions flow. If the unarmed protesters were, as the Israelis regularly claimed, quote, all Hamas, then they were the most incompetent, ter incompetent terrorists in history. Because the battle is so one-sided that it borders on the absurd. So if Hamas was really behind these protests, why aren't any Israelis being killed? Hamas has to be stronger than that. They must be the most ineffective terrorists of all time. Or, as is actually the case, they're not terrorists at all. They're peaceful protesters. The Israeli Defense Forces, the IDF, make a mockery of the broadly accepted jus in bello, means justice in war in Latin, strictures for justice in warfare, proportionality and discrimination. I went to West Point. We're taught about the law of war. We're taught about the Geneva Conventions. We're taught that there has to be proportionality and discrimination whenever you use force. Well, one must cohere with basic morals and international law. Strive only to kill combatants and to use only as much force as is necessary to remove the threat. But one look at the videos in Gaza speaks for itself. Israeli troops think they are above the law. Any law. And guess who else in the past has acted with such disdain for the principles of proportionality and discrimination? 
Hamas. Early Hamas. In the early days, when, before Hamas moderated. The IDF is no better than Hamas. The irony is lost on many Israelis and on many Americans. All the while, a U.S. president, whether he be Barack Obama, liberal, or Donald Trump, I don't even know what we call him, narcissist, uh, <laughs> conservative, sorry, I lose my... Uh, all the while, the U.S. president is silent and an American populace is implicated. There will be little time and less energy for mourning on American television today. Remember, I wrote this at 5.55 in the morning. The hawks will defend Israel, and they did. Quote, liberals will apologize for it. Trump will tweet. Kanye West will talk. And the Gaza story will pass. And it has. Palestinians, who are twice tainted, Muslims and Arabs, will never garner the sympathy of white America. I believe that in my heart. Their lives are worth less than the potential anxiety of a single Israeli. Washington and the entire US machine falls in line and backs Israel, it always does. And why not? We did this. We, the American people, and in my case, the American soldiers. We were accessories. We were complicit. I've been party. This is something I have to deal with. I've been party to America's war for the greater Middle East for decades now. While we lowly soldiers toiled and bled around the margins, propping up incompetent, faltering governments in Iraq and Afghanistan, the real work was getting done by Israel behind the scenes. I was but a cover. We were a symptom, even, of the real war in the Levant. In this struggle, Israel and Palestine, the U.S. blatantly took sides. We, the taxpayers, fed the Saudi and the Israeli beasts. There has been funding and excuses aplenty for these two partners, as we call them. In the Saudis, we back an intolerant theocracy, one of the last absolute monarchies on earth. They are murderous thugs, but there are murderous thugs. Yemeni civilians and Shia dissidents be damned. Ironically, the U.S. also empowers the far-right, ostensibly democratic government of Israel. In its last dubious and deceitful move, our beacon of freedom, America, recognized Jerusalem as the capital of the Jews and only the Jews. The move was one-sided, probably illegal. UN resolutions, after all, call for, call for a division and a final settlement of Jerusalem's status. And it helped fuel the latest wave of hopeless Palestinian disenchantment. From a purely strategic standpoint, which seems almost obscene in this blood-soaked moment, the unbridled U.S. commitment to Israel makes us, all of us, less safe. Because America's unqualified backing of Israel was one of Osama bin Laden's three published gripes. New Yorkers, like me, I'm from New York City, who knew little about this conflict, reaped its consequences when the two towers fell. As I entered and searched thousands of houses and apartments in Baghdad and Kandahar, scaring to death innocent families whose doors I kicked down. I was often amazed by the ubiquitous presence of posters and paintings depicting Al-Quds, Jerusalem. These people had never been to Jerusalem. They never left a 10 mile radius of their homes. But posters and paintings depicted the city of Jerusalem. I listened intently to the grievances of hundreds of peaceful Muslims who sought only to explain why so many of their fellow citizens tried to kill me and mine and succeeded in eight cases. And so it is. When the IDF, when the Israeli army shoots innocents, they place U.S. troops and U.S. civilians in the crosshairs. Our innocence is suspect because of our one-sided support for the Israelis. Today, at least, I'm really in no mood. This is what I wrote that morning. I'm in no mood for the attacks that will be headed my way. And they're always headed my way. They will say that I'm anti-Semitic for even daring to criticize the barbarous tactics of the IDF. They'll say that I'm a, quote, terrorist apologist. And on and on, the death threats will flow. They always do. It's all bull, of course. It's an absolute logical absurdity that's used to stifle our dissent. The IDF's choices and the cynical governing strategies of Prime Minister Netanyahu, a far right-wing uh, reactionary, do not encapsulate the whole of Israeli society. And those of you who have been to Israel know this. 
There are liberals and empathetic people within the nation of Israel. Even if their power has waned and their voices are regularly shouted down by the jingoists who are in charge of that government. Furthermore, to abhor the lopsided slaughter of Palestinians, many of them women and children, is not akin to denying Israel's inherent right to security and existence. This author, me, at least, is a humanist, a believer that Jewish and Arab lives matter, that all lives matter, as the conservative is so apt to tell us. And I'm an idealist in the sense that I cling to the hope that Israel can be both secure and humane. Maybe after the events of these past months, that's a forlorn fantasy. Perhaps we should have recognized this dark fact long ago. What I do know is this. The United States of America, whether ruled by liberal Obama or vaguely conservative Trump, can no longer even pretend to be a fair arbiter for peace in the Holy Land. We, all of us, are complicit in the totality of America's ill-fated, increasingly immoral crusade in the Middle East. We are the air wing or the air force of the Saudis unfolding genocide in Yemen. We are advisors and logisticians to an illegitimate, venal, and corrupt government in Afghanistan. We are the creators of a veritable monster who will now rule Iraq. And of course, we are the arms dealer and the big brother shielding the sins of an apartheid regime, as President Jimmy Carter accurately called it in Israel. Once upon a time, I was a believer. Perhaps I needed to believe. I was a soldier, but I was also a self-styled humanitarian. I was 17 and bent on ridding the region of evil and building a liberal society, of course, in America's own image. I fought on the duplicitous team that decried the death of each and every Western Caucasian victim of terrorism, but uttered not a sound in response to the gruesome massacre of brown Palestinians in Gaza. Maybe I fought on the wrong side. Maybe from our perspective there is no right side. Of this much I'm certain, I, indirectly, killed those unarmed men and women in Gaza and children at the Gaza border. My arms and my efforts enabled that massacre. The blood is on my hands and America's hands, and so is the shame. And so, with that stream of consciousness moment aside, I want to get back to the big picture and finish my talk. Next slide, please. There is, in the Muslim world, the accurate perception that Washington arms, funds, and otherwise enables an extreme right-wing Israeli regime that has systematically constructed an apartheid-like regime in the Palestinian territories, to the extent they exist anymore, of the West Bank and Gaza. Palestinians live as second-class citizens. They're under essentially military rule. They're restricted to separate roads, different water sources, alternative civil and political structures. They are walled off subjected to ubiquitous military checkpoints and are colonized by illegal Jewish settlements, which gets back to the U.S. media, or really the U.S. entertainment industry. You hardly hear about any of this, even on the liberal network, MSNBC. Palestinian lives, even children's lives, just do not garner much sympathy in the U.S. of A. They just don't. It's obvious and it's understandable. The American populace is treated to distraction media, there's precious little airtime left over for any mention of foreign policy. Foreign policy wasn't even on the agenda in the last midterm elections. I'm sure you guys saw all kinds of political commercials every day. You were tired of it. You saw the political commercials in Indiana. I bet not one of those political commercials mentioned foreign policy. I bet not one of those political commercials mentioned the war in Afghanistan, mentioned Gaza, mentioned the Middle East. I guarantee it did not. It didn't in Kansas. It didn't in Missouri. There's precious little airtime left over for mentions of foreign policy of the fact that the U.S. is at war in at least seven countries, that Yemenis are being starved and bombed to death by a Washington-backed Saudi coalition, and that the Israeli Defense Forces have been shooting down Gaza civilians for several months, nearly a year now. Next slide. Here's the kicker, though. You know who doesn't forget? Global Muslims. U.S. policy towards Israel and the Middle East more generally is and has been radicalizing a generation of impoverished, frustrated Muslim youth from West Africa to South Asia. This is a genuine national security threat, partly of our own making. Poll after credible global poll indicates that the international public considers the United States to be the greatest 
threat to world peace. Number two is Israel. Number two is Israel in global polls. Now, that might be an exaggeration. I don't necessarily agree that the United States is the number one threat to world peace in the world, but it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't even matter what's true. What matters is the world thinks that because it makes us less safe. It's not North Korea. It's not Syria. It's not Russia. It's not even China. Nope. America and Israel are the most potent threats to national security according to global polls. That's a problem, and it's obviously a threat to the U.S. homeland. What's more, there is little sign that Washington will reverse policy or rein in Israel's violence. To understand the cynicism of Israeli policy, consider that the Israelis are crafting a burgeoning partnership with the extremist Wahhabi state of Saudi Arabia. 15 out of 19 hijackers on 9-11 were Saudis. The Saudi state is the most extreme Islamist state in the Middle East. They're basically ISIS with a capital and with an army. And yet, they are somehow allied with the Israelis. That is a cynical move. The keepers of the holy places of Mecca and Medina, Saudi Arabia, the Saudis who ostensibly support the Palestinians, but don't really give a darn about them, and who spread their fundamentalist version of Islam across the region are now making a deal with Israel of all countries. And as for the Saudis, the U.S. shows no sign of pulling support from this murderous regime that just killed a Washington Post columnist, as you all know, anytime soon. The Saudis have briefly, if controversially, entered the news cycle after probably murdering uh, Khashoggi, the journalist. But the safe bet, from what Trump says, is that the U.S. will stick with the Saudis and close that $110 billion arms deal. So in sum, where exactly does the United States fit in all this? Well, it's rather simple, really. For the U.S. has shielded Israel from decades of critical United Nations resolutions. We have protected Israel from international law. That said, as a lowly soldier, that's me, who spent countless hours receiving earfuls of criticism, of U.S.-Palestine policy from distant Afghans and Iraqis, I'm certain of one thing. America's unjust favoritism of, Israeli, of Israel places U.S. servicemen at risk in the Middle East. Israel has a choice. It purportedly desires to be three things. This is what Israel wants to be. They want to be three things. They want to be Jewish, they want to be democratic, and they want to be expansive, encompassing all territory from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River. But it can only be any two of those, not all three. So if it is to be expansive and democratic, then it must absorb millions of Palestinians, at which case it would cease to be Jewish. If it continues to den deny statehood or full civil rights to the Palestinians, but remains expansive, then it will no longer be democratic. The best path seems obvious. A less expansive Israel that allows a genuine Palestinian nation-state of its own sovereignty, but only so long as the right-wing government of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is paramount, that solution is off the table. And so America, too, has a choice. It can be a fair arbiter, truly the beacon of democracy, it boisterously builds itself to be, or it can continue to favor Israel and ignore the plight of the Palestinians. I promise I am almost complete. If the U.S. ever hopes to win back friends on the Arab street to demonstrate consistency in its application of international law or just to live up to its own purported values from the Constitution and Declaration of Independence, well then the empathy gap must close. Palestinians are as human as Israelis and they are as human as Americans and it is time to act accordingly. This one-sided policy will have consequences. New terrorists will be motivated to attack the U.S. in response to our pro-Israel policies. Even General David Petraeus, far from a lefty pacifist like me, once even caused a stir and got himself in trouble by admitting that America's Israel policy motivates radical jihadis. Washington loves to tout Israel as, quote, the only democracy in the Middle East. That's not strictly true, of course. The inconvenient truth is that Israel may either be a Jewish state or a democratic state. It may not be both, since the large portion of its population remains Arab, remains Arab and Muslim. If the U.S. continues to enable Israeli violence and structural disenfranchisement of the Palestinians, it will reap the whirlwind. 
And when we are attacked, when we are attacked again, we'll revert to our usual cry. Why do they hate us? I can think of a few reasons. With that, let us choose ourselves here to spread the message that reflexive one-sided support for Israel and our instinctive framing of Muslims as terrorists harms our nation's soul and our own souls. Let us resolve here and now together to spread instead the message of empathy and peace and to try with what's left of our lives to find a goodness and a meaning in this life. Thank you.